Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, my name is Angela Mettler. I am an administrative assistant in the president's office at South Dakota Mines. And welcome to STEAM Cafe. Uh, we've been doing STEAM Cafe since April of 2018. Uh, STEAM Cafe is a partnership with Haycamp Brewing and South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Uh, and we could not do this without you. Uh, thank you also to everyone who is attending virtually tonight. Uh, we've expanded that since COVID hit and uh, it's been very successful. So I'm glad that everybody could be here either in person or virtually. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Carter Kirk, who is going to present on the Teospay Scholars Program at Mines. Mic check, is that, is that working? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, I wanna thank um, Hey Camp, South Dakota Public Broadcasting and the President's Office at the School of Mines for the support in putting on this event. And um, I, in case you don't know, I was kind of a late ad. I think they, their speaker was dropped out last, was not able to attend or whatever. And uh, so I'm always at the ready and I love to talk about this. So um, I'm really glad that, that you could be here tonight. And I know that we may have some folks um, joining us live, plus we'll be able to watch the recording later, okay? Um, one thing I wanna point out on this slide is today is March 16th and it's somebody in this room's birthday. So if you, it's your challenge to find out who it is and tell her happy birthday, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk about the TO Space Scholar Program. I'm gonna explain a little bit about it. And I have a special surprise, also a special surprise for you in the middle of the presentation. So start getting excited about that, okay? And Jessica, this is the second time you've heard me talk today and I really feel sorry for you, okay? So um, our vision, um, is to make sure that South Dakota can be recognized as an exceptional leader in the education of American Indian students in STEM. Um, we wanna prepare them to be leaders and you know, we feel this is part of our duty um, to the, we're, we're a state institution, we're a public institution to the people of South Dakota, the state of South Dakota, but also to the region, the nation and the tribes. So, um, you notice down in the corner on some of these slides, I've got some pictures of some of our Teoshpe alumni. We're really proud of them. Um, so that's what these pictures are sneaking into the corners here. Uh, why is this important? And I'll talk about this more in just a little bit, but um, I think you, everybody already knows that American Indians are very much underrepresented in STEM. Uh, and, we, and here we are in South Dakota, we got got a chance to do something about that. On the reservations, there's lots of challenges on the reservation. Um, one of the, and you start thinking about, well, how do you solve some of these problems? Well, one of the, the best solutions is education. And if we can offer a STEM education to some American Indian students, a lot of them wanna go back to work on the reservation or at least wanna help with their tribes. Um, so here, South Dakota Mines is right here in the middle of, uh, um, hello, uh, we're right here. We got nine Indian reservations in South Dakota. Um, and there's several reservations in the surrounding states. So uh, we're one of the best bargains schools in the country financially. We're close to home. We're right next to the sacred Black Hills. Um, there's just a lot of great things going on for us. So in, when we like to think that our program helps to energize other programs across campus, um, and we've already partnered with lots of programs across campus. So let's, let's talk about the underrepresentation just for a moment. Um, American Indians, Alaska Natives make up about 1.2% of the total US population. South Dakota, according to the Census Bureau, it's, it's a little over 9%, but folks that I talk to say it's probably considered significantly higher than that because the census doesn't count, um, it, it's, it's hard to count um, mixed heritage. And there's lots, of, maybe a lot of natives that don't even take part in the census. So it's probably considerably higher than 
about four tenths of 1% of engineering bachelor's degrees go to American Indians, very, very low, about 0.3% of the engineering workforce and about 0.1% of engineering faculty. So it's, it's, uh, it's low. Uh, the TO Space Scholar Program, now I'm, I'm gonna define TO Space in just a minute, but the purpose of the program is to dramatically increase the numbers of American Indian students earning degrees in STEM Everything we do in these programs, we try to center around these five areas. Having said that, our program is very much academic focused. Um, it's, it's located in uh, an academic, the academic side of the university. Um, it's, it's headed by a STEM professor and it's very much focused on producing graduates, okay? So whenever we start talking about, hey, let's do some other activities, we like, is it gonna help us to graduate more students? But we also wanna uh, honor everybody's culture. We wanna get everybody to know each other and we wanna help our graduates to be successful, to help prepare them to go um, into the workplace, to go on to graduate school and so on. So that's part of the program. It's not just to get them to graduate, but it's to help them have a successful, uh, su successful career. Now the word Teoshpe, um, Many of you may be familiar with it, but I know a lot of people are not. It's a Lakota word. It was given to us to use because it really defines what we're trying to do. When I wrote the first grant to the National Science Foundation, I had a title that said something like, support program for American Indians in engineering, okay? Which is exactly what it was. And um, so one of the uh, uh, Lakota, one of our um, elders on our advisory board said, Carter, we got we to gotta do better than that. We need more pizzazz. Use the word Teoshpe. So I'm like, well, what's the word Teoshpe? So I learned right away. It's this extended family of support, okay? And that's exactly what we're doing. We provide this extended family of support around the scholars as they're going through the program. A typical traditional scholarship, you award the scholarship, you pat the student on the back and say, good luck, okay? That is not how this program works. It is interactive. Um, you have to make a commitment if to, accept this, to accept the scholarship. If you're offered one, you have to agree to the commitment. You have to sign the agreement every semester. And you, uh, you have your responsibilities to attend the events. And I'll, I'll talk about a lot of the, the features up here in just a moment, but it's very much interactive. And, and if the scholars don't show up, we're contacting them. Hey, where were you? You don't have to have perfect attendance, but you know, you have to you have to be there most of the time, and there's reasons for that. Um, but if you think um, in the old days, um, you're trying on the on plains Indians, you're following a herd of buffalo, and trying to subsist, and a single family would be very difficult to follow a herd of buffalo and be able to hunt, cook, and, but a group of families working together, you got a group of hunters together, you can help take care of the children together, take care of the sick, and work as a, as a, a extended family or Teoshpe. And so this word has served us well for a couple of reasons. When we first submitted to NSF, the National Science Foundation, we said, hey, Teoshpe program, South Dakota School of Mines. They're like, what's that word mean? That opened up the door for us to explain what I just explained to you. And they loved it. They said, like, that's exactly what we're looking for. So that helped us get our first grant. The other place where it's great is, um, and I've been to every high school on all nine Indian reservations in South Dakota. Walk in the door. I'm Carter Kirk from South Dakota School of Mines. I'm here to talk to you about the Teosh Bay program. They're like, they already know what that means. Great, tell us how it works. They don't, they don't ask me what does Teoshpe mean, okay? They already know, and they're like, that's great, you have a Teoshpe program at the School of Mines. They love it. So a little bit of the history. Um, um, I am a very old person. I should tell you right now, I'm an old white guy, in case you don't know, I want to admit that. 
And uh, so, but I, when I came, I came to South Dakota School of Mines in 1997. Um, uh, some, in summer of 98, there was a skill program on campus, S-K-I-L-L, -L, Scientific Knowledge for Indian Learning and Leadership. It'd been on campus for a few summers. Um, and the campus liaison had left that spring. And they said, Carter, how would you like to work with the program? I'm like, what do I do? And they said, get in touch with them and ask them what they need. And I did, and I did, and we started a great relationship. Um, the, so I was working with Stacy Phelps. Um, he gave me a list of things to do, and I went and did them. A lot of them were logistics, like get us a class, get us classrooms, get us a place to play basketball. We need a place to sleep. We need a place to eat, that type of thing. So I helped with all those types of things. And then we moved on to, okay, can we go tour labs in all the departments? Can we meet faculty? Can we meet students? Can they give us talks? Can they take us on field trips? Things like that. Um, so we worked out all sorts of, uh, so I was like, a, um, I was the campus liaison it was really, and it really was fun. And I got to meet a lot of students. Um, and so th it was for ninth through 12th graders, American Indians to try to get them ready to go to college. We actually have uh, one of those students in the room tonight. You're gonna meet in just a minute. So I've known this lad since he was a, basically an eighth grader. Now he's all grown up, okay? So, um, and so we helped recruit them to college too. And that was the great thing. So then in, in those, so I ended up working for that, with that program for like 20 years, um, the, representing the campus with the program. And uh, so all those years, I mean, I could go to any, pretty much any school in South Dakota on the reservation. And they already, a lot of the students already knew who I was. In fact, they knew my dog better than they did me because I would bring my dog to do tricks. And um, they were like, hey, how's your dog? Um, but they knew, what the, they knew what School of Mines was. They knew a little bit about engineering and science. So that was great. So um, that's how this got started. It turns out Stacy Phelps was working at Oglala Lakota College during those years. And he's like, Carter, we have a pre-engineering program at OLC. They take in calculus, chemistry, and physics. And then we want them to transfer to a university where they can finish an engineering degree. If they come to the School of Mines, could you help them? And I'm like, sure, I'll be glad to. We had no money. Okay, but I helped them with advising and mentoring and working through some of their problems and so on. But we didn't have, we didn't really have any money. And we started to dream about what if we had money, you know? And the comment, and I'd like to um, frame the, these decades. So I'm calling this the decade of 2000 to 2010 was kind of that era where we had these students coming over from places like OLC to finish their degree. And there weren't very many of them, but they were very dedicated. Um, but they would often say, Dr. Kirk, I know I'm not the only native student on campus, but I feel like I'm the only one. You know, I never see anybody else. And, and, uh, and a lot of them graduated, some of them did not. It's, it was difficult. So at the end of that decade is when we got the chance to submit our first grant to the National Science Foundation for the Teoshpe program. And we ended up uh, getting three awards at the, towards the beginning of the de this decade of 2010 to 2020, it was over $1.8 million. 85% of that money had to go to scholarships. And that was great. We got to go recruit and start to bring in students. We, we found ex students that already existed on campus and brought them into the funding. And we were able to go recruit new students. That... Um, we also had other donors. We had some private donors and some corporate donors that, that really helped us along the way. And uh, a significant one was the Malone family uh, donated um, a significant amount of money to help with the renovation of one of the buildings so that we now have our TO space study rooms. We have an office for the mentor. We have a group study room and we have a quiet study room and they have card key access. So our students can really get in there and, and and it's also located right next to my office. So it makes it really easy to stay in touch with each other. So what we say is for the RTO Spay at the School of Mines, once you help us with anything, you're part of the TO Spay, okay? So um, here's a list. We've always had great help support from all the presidents going back to Dr. Gowan up to now uh, President Rankin, um, several provosts, we have had uh, some great cultural advisors along the way and lots of great co-PIs that have been helping with the project. 
I'm not going to read through this list, but all sorts of different folks on campus. We needed to, to team up with financial aid and admissions and counseling center and career planning. We needed help from everybody on campus really to pull this off. And uh, everybody always came through for us when we, when we needed help. We have several partners. We uh, partner with OLC, with the Sanford Underground uh, Research Facility, the NSF All Nations AMP, which I'm gonna talk about in a, in a minute, the South Dakota Space Grant Consortium, and so on. I also wanna point out, um, uh, Mr. Brad Johnson is sitting here from CARA. Let me put a laser on CARA. That's the Center for Advancement and so Center for Alumni and Alumni Relations and Advancement. I'm still learning that. It's, it's what was the foundation. And uh, Brad has been instrumental in helping us secure funding in the past. And I'll be telling you about some of our plans for the, for the future, okay? So the components of the TOSB program, remember those five areas of support with financial, academic, professional, cultural, and social. So everything kind of fits in there. It starts with recruiting, uh, going out to the tribal high schools, um, but also the tribal colleges. And we did a lot of, we also did recruiting at Central High School, turned out, that Rapid City Central turned out to be a great place. And then we had students that just found us from other states. So um, we've had South Dakota, Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, Arizona, for states that were, we've had students come from to be in our program. Um, the FAFSA was required now, and this is, the, this is the 2010 to 2020 era. We were under the NSF, National Science Foundation requirements. It was financial need. Students had to fill out the FAFSA, had to sign agreements. We had orientation sessions to try to get them up and running, right, try to get them up and running as soon as classes were starting. Um, they had to meet monthly with, at least monthly with me, and weekly with the, the mentor. And we've had some fabulous mentors along the way. Um, Jackie, D, Vanessa, um, and, and if you ask any of our any of our graduates or scholars, uh, they will have nice things to say about our mentors. Um, we had a biweekly lunch meeting every every two weeks on a Tuesday at noon noonish. We would bring in some food. Uh, students like food. That was one of the things that we've learned. You have food. And often that will that'll attract students better than anything. And then we'll have like a professional presentation. It may be from financial aid talking about tips on how what's new with FAFSA or how to fill out your FAFSA. If you don't know what FAFSA is, it's the it's the it's the form you have to fill out um, for um, for financial aid for federal financial aid. And oftentimes, if you're low income, it will help you to get a Pell Grant. Okay, and Pell Grants can be four or $5,000 a year. So very significant if you're coming from a family that has limited resources. So we really wanna start with, hey, become eligible for your Pell Grant or get your Pell Grant. And that now we start to piece together that with the funding from our program and, and then encouraging them to apply for other scholarships, which by the way, we would have workshops, uh, workshops and coaching on scholarship applications, okay? And, and a lot of our students were very successful in getting other other scholarships and funding. Um, we had required study sessions, especially the, for the first year students. It's a real shock to come to college for the first time, especially at a place like the School of Mines. And so we wanted to try to help them. Um, we, we tried to do cohorted sections. So if we had five students going into Calc 2, we tried to at least try to get them into the same section of Calc 2. So they'd have the same instructor, they could sit together in class and it would make their study sessions go better because they're all in, in sync with each other and so on. Uh, regular meeting with their advisors, early registration. We always want our TOHB scholars to be re among the first to sign up for classes, not only for the, uh, the, the following semester, but two semesters in advance. So we're really proactive with that type of thing. Um, creating resumes, re uh, critiquing resumes, improving our resumes. It never stops. Every semester, you turn in another resume. We work closely with career planning, getting ready for the career fairs, coaching, coaching them on how to navigate the career fair. And uh, we would have presenters come in, faculty members would come in from on campus to recruit them into like summer research programs, the REUs. We've been very successful with our uh, REU programs on campus, recruiting TO space scholars. Um, but also we had companies come in and would, would, well, they would buy the lunch, you know, we would order steak on those days, you know. So uh, anyway, um, 
a lot of access to our study rooms, um, required membership in ACES. I don't think I've talked about ACES yet. A-I-S-E-S, -E -S, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, okay? Uh, we, School of Mines has one of the best chapters in the nation, award-winning chapter. I think the co-president of ACES is here tonight, okay? So um, that's great. Um, and then every fall we had a Thanksgiving potluck where we encourage the students to invite your families to come. And, and we would invite everybody from across campus that was in our Teoche Bay to, to join us. And we had a nerd ceremony in the spring where they would be christened as nerds. Um, this is a, the nerd ceremony, something we stole from the University of Alaska. Uh, it, was, it was very popular up there. They did it one year as a joke. And then after that, the, the other students were like, oh, how come we didn't get to have a nerd ceremony? So it became very popular. So then we stole it, started doing it here. You get a pair of black glasses with some white tape you get a t-shirt, um, which is very cool. It's in Lakota and it's in Lakota and calculus, okay? And uh, um, it, was, it was pretty fun to do. We, we really enjoyed our nerd ceremony. So during that decade, 2010 to 2020, we've had 50 graduates. We just had our 50th graduate last December. Uh, we're very proud of that. On one hand, 50 may not sound like an impressive number to you, but we, we worked really hard and we're really proud of that, but we got to make it bigger, okay? We got to keep going. Um, only 30% female, wish it was higher. We got a lot of room for improvement on females, um, but we're working on it. You can see the different majors on campus in which we graduated students, so we're, we're proud of that. Um, several of our alums are either working for tribes or working some way with tribes. So we're proud of that. Uh, many have completed their master's degrees, graduate degrees. Uh, our first student is this close to getting their PhD. And then we've had one that just graduated from medical school about a year ago, and he's doing a residency in anesthesiology in the Twin Cities, and um, he's a doctor. And that's just amazing. Um, now, during the latter part of the decade, I knew we were running out of money. I wrote three more proposals to NSF. They were all rejected. The last one is the best proposal I ever wrote. It was rejected. I was angry. I stomped holes in the ground for a few days. And then I remembered, they told us from day one, this is not meant to be a perpetual funding machine. We'll get you started. You build your model. You figure out how to make it work. And then you figure out how to sustain it. Okay, I still wish they could have given us some more money to keep going, but nevertheless. So what we're doing now is, oh, uh, and part of that, uh, well, through the rest of the decade, we still had money left, but we just couldn't use it to recruit new students. It could only go to, to students that were already in the program. So that's how we got to 50. We graduated everybody that was, that was still around, almost everybody that's still around. We still have a couple more students that are gonna graduate very soon, okay? So unfortunately, we, had to, we stopped recruiting. And that's, that's sad, we gotta get back to that. So I wanna present to you our vision for the future. But before that, let's talk about what we learned. Um, we learned that the, you guys can sign autographs later, okay? I want one too. We, we learned that the name, we got a great name. Okay, I already talked about that quite a bit. We learned that focusing on degree completion is really important, okay? Um, it's really important to keep, what, the, what is the goal? The goal is to graduate, okay? Um, we learned that our five areas of support were working, are working. One of the questions we've got is like, hey, if you found another pot of money, are you sure you could even find students that would want it? We know that they're there. We already, we've already learned that. We've discovered there's plenty of American Indian students that wanna get engineering and science degrees, not a problem. But the most exciting thing is this critical mass. Once we got a place for the students to study together and we got enough students recruited into the program and they started using that and buying into what we we're doing, they kind of took over themselves. We got a, enough students there. They kind of took it over themselves. They started having study groups, just took over the study room. Um, they were there almost all the time. <laughs> Um, if people weren't showing up, 
they were sending them texts and phone calls saying, where are you? Instead of me having to do that. And they, okay, incoming freshmen, I'm sitting with them and saying, okay, here's how hard you're gonna have to study. Here's how much time you're gonna have to study. It's going to be hard. You have to dedicate yourself. And they listened to me politely, but it probably didn't really register. But when they get into this room, the freshmen, sophomore get into the room with the juniors and seniors and the juniors and seniors have battle scars all over them from um, learning the hard way, I guess. And when the senior tells the freshman, here's how hard you have to study. Here's what happened to me when I was in Calc 1. I had to take it three times. And they're like, how is that even possible? Yeah, it's possible because I'm still here and I moved on, okay? So they learn about that perseverance and they really listen to those upperclassmen. So that was the beauty of the critical mass. I got to, I got to witness it with my own eyes and it, it's, it's like magic. Alum, our alumni testimonials are very impressive and food is a good thing to have around. So those are kind of the things we learned. Now, we're ready for a testimonial. How are we doing for time? What time is it? 626, perfect. Okay, let's hear a big round of applause for Logan Gayton. Come on, Logan. I found this picture of Logan. I think he was a freshman in college and now he's all grown up. And, uh, but he's gonna, he's gonna talk to us for a few minutes. So my name is Logan Gayton. Um, I grew up born and raised here in Rapid City. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Um, I graduated from Central High School back in 2012, and the more we get further away from that, the less I feel like I look like that, and I don't <laughs> like it. But um, I started my path towards higher education um, right when Carter had said that uh, back in 2008, I had met him. Um, I went into the South Dakota Gear Up program, and that was the first time I had found myself on the School of Mines campus. Um, coincidentally and embarrassingly, I have to admit that I didn't know what the School of Mines was until I was already a senior in high school. Um, uh, the, a professor came in and gave a presentation on uh, metallurgical engineering and, and all of that. And finally, I was like, hey, I think I'm smart enough to go to this school. And so after being on campus for about four or five years, I finally realized that um, it was something that I could do. Um, so after that presentation, I tracked down Carter and figured out how I could come to this school. And he let me know about the Teosh Bay program um, and said that if my grades were well enough and I got into the school and everything, that there was the financial assistance that he talked about. There was the tutoring, um, the academic help, um, meeting with the counselors and stuff like that, um, and countless other things that came up for the Teosh Bay program. And at that point, I was already full sent on submitting at least an application to get in. Um, at that point in time, I was a football player and a wrestler, and so that really resonated with me. Um, so I was like, I'm going to set my sight on coming to the School of Mines and play football. Well, that didn't happen, but I'm glad it kind of didn't because... I don't think I could have been an athlete and gone to this school. So for the student athletes that are have made it through and are still making it through, good on you because oh, it's rough. Um, but I think the most important thing that I learned through my time here at the School of Mines and going through the Teosh Bay program um, was that there was a lot of internal resilience that had to be built to make it through the school. Um, and the support group that came from the Teosh Bay program um, that I had built up myself, um, I, and you can hear it from a lot of different students where they failed the class or they just had a really rough semester where they had some mental health issues come up. And I, I was a student who had that. I had failed basically in an entire semester um, never failed a class in my entire life, always was the kid that I would will things into submission. Um, I would just work so hard that they would work themselves out. Um, but I got to a point where no matter how hard I worked and how hard I tried, I just couldn't pick something up. Um, 
and Vanessa and Dee um, were the mentors that we had in the room. And uh, for weeks, I would say even months, I went into their office and worked with them and talked with them. And it was at the end of the semester where finally my, I didn't pass any, like I passed half the classes that semester, which was strong for how that went but they helped me recover in my mental health so that I could start retaking those classes over the summer, which after failing those classes, I'm proud to say I got A's over the summer in those classes, which in summer classes, that's not easy to do either. But, um, and after that semester, it was kind of full swing into my um, general classes um, for my major. So I uh, got a bachelor's back in 2017 um, in civil engineering. Um, and I had a core group of friends. Um, some were older, some were younger. Um, and one of them, his name is Stott Newbro. He had gotten here, I want to say, around 2010, 2009 or so. Um, there's Adonis Martinez who got here in 2011. Um, Leo Chasen and Timber also got here in 2011. Shane Starr, who got here a year after me, and he was my mentee. Um, and we were all civil engineers together. And I think when Carter talks about how we kind of took the reins of the program, um, it is it, that it really was just that. Um, we started off in the basement of McClory um, and the, it's kind of like a broom closet is what it felt like. So we had two rectangular, I wanna say two by four, four and a half feet long. And we would have 10 students stacked in that room. And um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Native American culture, but uh, I would call it a sweat lodge almost because you had so many bodies in such a small room that it even started to feel a little humid. Um, but that was kind of the start. We, as Carter said, we had our own room and we had access to the room 24 seven. And so we had no excuse to not come somewhere together to study. And so um, I don't remember who shot first, whether it was me or Adonis, but basically we ended up just basically living in the Teosh Bay room. We uh, got bookshelves and we hid all of our uh, um, textbooks and notebooks and stuff. And we'd get there. Oh, I don't think I've ever done this in my life, but I got, uh, we would get there at seven o'clock, 6 a.m. most mornings and we wouldn't leave until well, we'd leave probably around four for a quick nap and then we'd come back at around eight and do it until 2 a.m. or whatever. But we, we just lived in the Teosh Bay room. And then fortunately enough, the donation came through um, and they renovated the basement of the library and we got our two study rooms. And so um, in order to create a sweat lodge, we'd need a lot more bodies. Um, so um, yeah, and it took, I don't know, maybe six weeks after we got our own study room to build a core group of people that were regularly sh showing that they also wanted to make it through the school. Um, and that's one of the hard things because Stoughton had been here for a couple years before I had gotten there and before Adonis, or Adonis had gotten there. So he was kind of off by himself and he, he struggled a little bit and Finally, when Adonis got here, there was some more people that he could talk to, but he, Stoughton was a couple years ahead of us. Um, and he had to take some time off for a little bit. And then once we all kind of assembled together, we got to a point where we were all in the same classes. We had no excuse to not ask somebody, hey, I missed this part of the lecture, or um, I had a sick kid at home and I couldn't go to the lecture, can I get your notes? there was always an accountability thing. Or if somebody didn't tell us they were gonna miss class, um, it was a little bit written more with profanity, but it's like, where, where were you in the first place? Um, there was a couple times where Leo was gonna study with us and he fell asleep and you can't wake Leo up for anything. And so me and Adonis drove our way over there and Leo had locked the door to his bedroom and the door to his house but he didn't lock the, his window. So we opened his window and we forcibly woke him up and brought him to campus. Um, and so I don't think he was anticipating studying, but he did. Um, and that was just kind of the thing that it took. Um, you, you, grow, you come from a background where there's not a lot of people who have gone to college. Um, when the word FAFSA comes up, everybody looks and says, 
what what's that even mean? How do I fill that out? What do I even do with it? Um, and then once you actually get into the school and you're going to the school, sometimes you have people who ha have parents and brothers and sisters who never made it through high school. So you don't have those people there. And that's everybody too. Um, not just Native Americans, but people from all backgrounds, regardless of where their social standings are. Um, everybody struggle. I, I have this personal quote that I like, we're all broke in the same color. We all struggle in that same regard. And Teosh Bay allowed it for Native Americans to not have to worry about the financial as much so that we could focus on the struggle of being in school, making friends and trying to finally fit in somewhere. Um, there was times where I would talk to Shane um, and it was his first year and he had said, I just don't think I belong. Nobody likes me, nobody gets it. And I just had to sit him down and said, dude, you're always gonna feel like you're not gonna belong everywhere. It's just the thing that everybody in their, the back of their mind says, they're just nice to me because that we, because they have to, or because it's the nice thing to do. And nobody otherwise cares. So I had to have that conversation with them and said, you got here, you belong here. And if you don't think you belong here, well, make yourself belong here. And he is in the middle of a master's program now. Um, so, um, and also I made it through my master's program. So that's kind of a testimony of not just the camaraderie, but all of the help that the Teosh Bay program is able to provide for um, its students. Um, did I miss anything? Thank you. A lot of times when uh, people ask the scholars, you know, how fabulous was the scholarships? Um, they really expect this, this, that the, the scholarships were the most important part. And like, hey, the, the, the money was great. It really helped me. But what was more important was the group, the camaraderie, camaraderie group. That, that's what they appreciate the most from the program. It's not the money, it's the support system. So, all right, we got to keep moving. Hey, can you tell me what time it is, Angela? 6.37. Oh, I think we're doing good. Okay. Um, can I, is it okay if you guys, I take Logan's picture down? <laughs> um, okay. So our vision for the future, as I already indicated, we're going to kind of, we're pivoting from federal funding to private funding. That's our, that's our big plan. Now um, we think that there are some uh, wealthy individuals, philanthropic foundations and organizations that will help us. Um, we haven't asked anybody yet. We're getting ready to. Um, I'm probably going a little bit too slow for Brad's liking, but we are getting our act together and all of our ducks in the row, and we are getting ready to go ask. And I, I'm very confident that we're going to be able to pull this off. We're seeking two multi-million dollar endowments. They're big. Um, I think we can go to these folks and say, look, we've already built the program government money. We know that it works. We know how to make it work. Uh, if you would fund this, your name will be on it and it can last forever. An endowment will, will spin off the interest and we'll, we'll run off the interest and we won't have to sit there and worry every couple of years, where are we going to get our next round of funding? Uh, we will focus on recruiting, retaining, and graduating students in these programs. So we're very confident. The worst thing they can do is say no. Um, and we'll go to the next person on the list. So um, thank you, Brad, for all your support. And so, um, and, then, and then we get that established. We'll have a second layer of support from individuals and corporations to help with more scholarships and more, more support. But our big support has to come from these, these endowments. Um, the scholarships, we would have more scholarships and larger scholarships. I want to point out that we're not, we're not into giving a full ride, okay? We want the students to also take some ownership of it. We want to encourage them to go get summer jobs and research positions in the summer that pay so they can help um, pay for some of it. We want them to apply for Pell Grants and other scholarships um, so that they have some investment in it. So we're not into full rides, but we're into really, really nice, big scholarships, okay? Um, we'll have, still have a low income preference, but we'll also have another 
area well we'll go for academic just academic talent and not worry about their fafsa okay before we had lots of american indian students that came to us that were interested in the program but they were not they were either middle income lower middle income upper lower income however you want to say it and they didn't couldn't qualify because of the the way their fafsa turned out but they didn't necessarily have the money to go to college either so but we couldn't help them. Uh, with this new program we will be able to help them, those students too uh, and another thing we're very excited about is the graduate student support. Everything we've done so far is for the bachelor's degree. Now we're going to have another pot of money where we'll have matching funds for, so other faculty members on campus, if they're writing a grant, they can put in support for our graduate students. And if they can recruit one of our American Indian students, we'll be sitting there with matching funding so that their dollars can go farther. And, and because we already know a lot of our students want to go on for graduate degrees. We're gonna have more and better food, okay? And uh, the, the director would be an endowed chaired position, uh, full-time mentor with benefits before our mentor was part-time without benefits. Um, we're gonna work more on assessment, research and publication of our program. We'll have some support for that. We're gonna have, depart we already have department members on every, in every um, department on campus, the academic departments, but we'll have funding for them to, be, to do that job and, um, and, and support for ACES, uh, more money for travel and so, things like that. So we got to get our story in front of the right people. Um, our, every scholar, every graduate, all 50 of them are basically saying, let me help, let me help, okay? So we've got that going for us. Um, I think I've already talked about all this. So uh, in the meantime, there's gonna be a gap between you know, our, our federal funding has ended. There's going to be a, it's going to be a, a, a period of time before we can raise millions and millions of dollars. Okay, so what are we going to do in the meantime? We have an interim program. Uh, we've doubled down on our participation in the NSF AMP program. That's Alliance for Minority Participation. It's not a huge amount of money, but it has gone up in the past. And uh, so you can kind of see here, uh, for GPA, they can, you know, if you have a GPA above a 3.5, you can get $3,600 a year, and it's pretty easy to get. But I'm trying to help all of our students on campus that are eligible for this to apply for it and get it. Once they do that and they join ACES, they're a TO Space Scholar. Okay, so that's kind of the, the essence of what our interim program. At the moment, we have 16 TO Space Scholars, okay? One of them is sitting right down here in front. Shane is going to graduate in May. Okay, so that is very exciting. <laughs> so we're not we're not out of business right now. We're still operating at a little lower level, um, but we're working on the future. So, it, how can you help? Uh, one is the, the main thing is just to network with us, help us. Help us under, understand what we're trying to do. Talk to us. Um, it's kind of, we're trying to get out there to these donors. Uh, the, my standard line is we want to try to get to the Warren Buffets of the world, okay? And uh, I'm not joking, okay? Um, and if you're Warren Buffett's grandchild, you know, just tell us and we'll and introduce us, you know? Um, I mean, that's half joking, half serious. You never know who you might know that could really help us. And we have some really good ideas that we're putting in play. And Brad and I are pretty excited about these ideas, but um, we, we need help, we need a network. Um, so help us spread the word. But is there any questions in the room? And I know that um, there may be some questions on the, off the feed. There, I just, I answered all their questions in my presentation, right? Okay, good. How about in the room, anybody have any questions? I should also say we have a future TO Space Scholar down here, Sage. You want to wave at everybody, Sage? <laughs> Sage has grown up in the program and she's already an honorary TO Space Scholar. Even if she doesn't want to be, she is. Yes, Jade. Uh, me too. And so Jade, I don't know if you can hear on the microphone. Jade, what year did you graduate? 
09. So yeah, right before it started. And uh, so, and by the way, I don't want to, it's a secret, but today's Jade's birthday. So I don't, don't tell anybody. It's on the recording now, Jade. Um, but Jade was one of those, like I said, in that decade of 20, 2000 to 2010, you know what it was like. Um, there wasn't that much support. Um, we wanted to support our students, but we didn't have financial support. So that's why it's important for, for you know, and Jade is helping us already, but to, for just for Jade to be able to tell that story of what it could have meant to her. And, um, and then for like Logan and Shana, they can help us go to the next level and provide that for future generations. It's, it's kind of, uh, it should set me sending tingles up and down your spine right now. If it's not, you were sleeping through my presentation. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. One more time. Sure. Uh, um, the whole story? Okay, well, um, so uh, Logan is suggesting that we tell, talk a little bit about Austin P. Richards, okay? Uh, Austin, um, fantastic uh, story um, and sad. Um, Austin went to Little Wound High School. He was one of the best high school basketball players in the history of the state of South Dakota. Set all sorts of records. He was incredible. He was so good uh, at sports, he didn't really think about academics. And then he went to college, and, and he actually, I think, played at three different colleges. And he, and this is him telling the story now, is like, uh, I didn't care about academics. If they wanted me to play basketball, fine. I didn't care about it. So he kind of like flunked out of, kept flunking out of school, then and going to another school to play basketball. And so finally, that kind of ended, and he realized that college was done for him. So he, he became an electrician, and he was a licensed electrician, was working on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, Stacy Phelps recruited him, ran into him one day, and Stacy already knew him, but uh, said, hey, come to OLC and take our pre-engineering courses. Well, Austin had never applied himself academically before, um, and so he goes in there and starts taking calculus, chemistry, and physics, and he loved it. And he, by now he's an older student, and he, got, he came and was in um, uh, a summer program for college students, and that's when I got to meet him, and this guy was just inspirational. Um, it was before we had our funding. Um, he decided to come to the School of Mines, and, and it, was, it was really tough for him. He had a lot, lot going on, but he was the most positive, inspirational student. Um, unfortunately, he had difficulties. He, he didn't make it all the way through, um, but he, he was just an inspiration for all of us. And um, he died at a young age. And we just appreciate him so much that we named one of our awards after him. Uh, it's for the student that has you know, participate, active participation in program that's so important. So we named our participation award after Austin. Did you ever win it? Did you ever win it? Six times? Six time winner? That tells you a little bit about Shana right there. Our other award, uh, President Wharton was uh, very helpful with our program. And of course, he passed away, unfortunately. But and to honor him, uh, we give our, our academic award. It's called the, uh, the President Wharton Award. And we have a beautiful plaque, and you can look through some pretty fancy names that are on these plaques. Is that kind of what you want me to tell? He also gave me my Lakota name. I don't know if you were around when that happened. He, he set up, a, he set up a, a presentation in the ballroom, and he gave me my Lakota name, which is... Um, I'm going to try to tell you here. It is, it's walking bird is what it is. And I, I tried to, to have him change it to running bird. And he said, no, it's walking bird. And uh, um, so I'm really proud to have a Lakota name. Thanks to Austin. Any other questions? Angel, how are we doing for time? 649. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. For those of you that are uh, watching this on remotely or if you're watching this recording later, um, right here on the screen, you've got my phone number. That's my cell phone number. You can text me, you can call me, you can email me. Um, and with other questions, we really want to talk to you. I'd like to get, I would like to talk to you, um, answer any questions you have. And if there's any, any ways that you can help with us, network with us, we really, really appreciate it. Richie, I'm glad to see you tonight too. And okay.
Thank you very much. Working yet? Yep, okay. Just wanted to say again, thank you for attending uh, in person or virtually. And uh, Steam Cafe happens every third Tuesday, uh, 6 p.m. at Hay Camp. So next month, uh, the presentation is going to be Dr. Robert Hall, who is the head of the Mining Engineering and Management Department. And he's going to speak about the new mining hub coming to campus. Um, I believe the date is April 20th. It's the third Tuesday in April. I think that's, that's right. Um, anyway, thanks for coming. Hope to see you next month. Thank <laughs> you.